So, as we said before, Rishi Sunak has come in and he's going to certainly, by the looks of it, definitely have a bit of a longer honeymoon period than, uh, than Liz Truss. But, of course, we'll find out how the public reacts to these costs, uh, certainly of the budget that he wants to pass on the 17th. And I've said it once and I'll say it again, we are probably going to get austerity 2.0 when it comes to his budget. Both him and Jeremy Hunt are a lot more right-wing than Boris Johnson was, who was described by towards his tenure as not conservative by some of his own fellow conservative MPs. So <laughs> it is definite on the agenda. We are going to get certainly tax cuts, but I think they are going to try and pretend it's not, all, not austerity. And I say pretend by saying, oh, but look, we're raising taxes here. This is not austerity, but we're raising taxes while this, while the, you know, don't, don't look at this. Don't look at this part. Um, which is kind of a, 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 the weird point of it all. But one of the things that I'm quite interested in is certainly the the perception that is now going to emerge between what would potentially be a general election of Keir Starmer versus Rishi Sunak. And at the moment, I think Starmer's going to have maybe a bit harder time against Sunak. And I sort of agree what we're going to be here, that Starmer really needs to up his game. But going all the way back to when he was up against Boris Johnson, I always said, you know, Say what you like about, about Boris Johnson, but Boris Johnson was a good public speaker and he knew how to tell a story. And so far, Starmer has not crafted the narrative of a Labour in power. And that is where he is failing. But, but as I've always said, we've got to see what's in the manifesto. And I think going all the way back to when Starmer first came in, you will always remember I said, Starmer should release a manifesto. Starmer should come out and say, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that is still very much the case. And things could change when he releases the manifesto and says, this is Labour's manifesto. This is how we're going to move forward. This is what I want to do with uh, you know, Labour in power. So let's have a look at uh, what this focus group had to say, because I think it is very interesting and definitely very worth discussing. So before we do go jump into that, please do remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button. And of course, uh, thank you very much to all those people who uh, do help and support the channel. And down below, there is a link to my uh, Patreon page and one-off donation link called Buy Me Coffee. We can well buy me coffee. There is also the one-off donation link called the YouTube Thank You button down below as well. And there is the YouTube Pony Club as well. You can join also, link below in the in the doobly-doos. So uh, this, goes, uh, this focus group was done by The Guardian as part of one of their um, groups called UK More in Common. And I have to say, I would love to be on a focus group because um, some of the, some of these things I would love to like push back against, like with, with some of these people, but we'd see. So this focus group was done in Sedgefield, which was Tony Blair's uh, seat when he was prime minister. That is now again turned blue. So it's one of these sort of red wall seats. But it's interesting how they are describing, certainly, Rishi Sunak, saying that he is here, the money man, and with a CV that proves he was, quote, the best of a bad bunch. Bear in mind, Rishi Sunak has not really gone on record about policy and what policy changes he would like to do. He's been very sort of focused on the economy, but even then, What's Rishi Sunak's stance on the economy? I mean, we heard him during the, the Tory leadership contest of, oh, we have to sort of, you know, tighten our belts. We have to sort of think real, you know, in, in real terms about what we do with the economy. But what does that actually mean as a policy? And that is so far only what we've heard of Rishi Sunak. And we're going to find out in, in a couple of days' time um, what, Sunak's policy actually means and we've always said that when it came to spending Sunak has some, said said some stuff in the past 
which has said that he is sort of a lot more right wing when it comes to fiscal policy uh, on that. So we're going sort of very, very back to, as we've said before, austerity territory, certainly with Sunak. I think that's where we're headed. Um, but they also had uh, this to say about him. He does seem competent. And he seems to have the ability to move the Conservative Party forward, said Steve, who questioned why the Tories didn't vote for him at the first leadership election instead of his predecessor, Liz Truss. Rishi is the money-oriented guy. You want someone who knows how to retain money and has a platform to change things without having an overbearing personality, uh, said Jerome, 37-year-old uh, delivery driver. So... This is easily one of the interesting points because Sunak has put himself forward that he is the money guy. But how, you know, will he actually help the perception? Like I say, the Bank of England just this morning has said that we are going into a long recession. Um, and of course, you can see it on the side here. Longest recession since the 1930s. That is not good. That is not good at all. Uh, certainly a direction that uh, of, we have going in. But he also went on to say um, he feels hopeless and fears for the future of the country because the government, quote, knows they're not doing a good job. And he has rolled out policies to, tr to try and tackle the energy crisis that only help the richest. So there is really a sense, as we've said before, in the Red War, that Sunak's policies, when it comes to a proper conservative Tory manifesto, I don't think will fly in the Red War. I, I, I've said before, I think now you've taken Johnson out of the equation, Brexit's not there. I think the Conservative Party policies are going to be very, very hard to sell. And I think one of the things that we... Uh, we'll we'll see later on uh, is is that Starmer has to step up and he has to put forward I think some good policies and he has to be able to sell them very accurately and articulate them to the British people what it is he is sort of selling to them so where is the so here's here's the thing and this is what this is what i've proved uh what i've been saying actually so when it came to labor they had this to say i don't think he is starmer will be able to do any of the things that he is saying that he will do. I don't have the confidence that he can perform from the impression that he leaves and how he comes across, uh, Laura, uh, one of Laura, one of the, the group's youngest members, said. Uh, Josh and Jerome also said that Starmer was a good, finger, good at finger pointing and calling the Tories out, but not good at setting out his own plan. This is it. He's got to be able to set it out. He's in a position of power right now, and he can call things out. This gives us hope because there's at least there is someone out there who is holding people at that level accountable. But we're not seeing what his solutions are. And there are some Labour solutions. There is the green energy policy. Um, I, I think Starmer should lean in towards PR. And I think if he doesn't really want to reform the House of Commons, the House of Lords is a massive open goal target he could reform. And a lot of people would back him in that play. There is also, I've talked about the decarbonization of the steel industry that he could do. He could do a wealth tax. Again, a what a 0.01% wealth tax on the UK's most wealthiest is basically the equivalent to not only a year's uh, amount of a year's sort of funding for not only the NHS, but all our social services in one budget. And we're talking 0.01%. Of the population pays a one percent on their wealth, so that could sell very, very well. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, he, Steve, said he preferred uh, the Starmer's deputy Angela Rayner, so that is certainly good coming across for Angela Rayner if 
uh, she runs again. Uh, she will be biding her time before she tries to run again for the Labour leadership uh, before the next general election. Starmer brings nothing new to politics. He's a professional politician. Uh, again, he's not a really professional politician. He was a he was he was a, he was a lawyer for years. Um, and this is one of the most interesting ones because asked if there was anything that Starmer could do to say or convince them to fully back him, no members of the group responded. And I think that is easily the most worrying thing. And it's got two implications. Because first of all, you've got an implication here of a group that is so politically fed up and even apathetic that they cannot even think of a proposal that someone, that Keir Starmer could come and say to them, I'm going to do this. Will you vote for me and back me on it? That is quite shocking. Because I know if I was in that focus group, I could have immediately said, as we said, I could do PR, uh, decarbonization of the steel industry, um, you know, the, the wealth tax. There's there's so much you could actually really say in one of these focus groups. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely, definitely it would be quite interesting going forward. And of course, the other thing is that this is also Starmer, where if Starmer can pick, I think, a big sort of flagship policy, I think Starmer and Labour will do very, very well at the next general election. Something that can sort of sort of distance them from the Tories, but also something that the Tories themselves won't go near. And I think the wealth tax, I think PR... I think a lot of real good stuff, like focusing on the economy, how we can build the economy, you know, and a proper industrial plan would be amazing. Now, those ideas are there in the Labour Party. The problem is, is I see the almost exact same thing that Corbyn did of he's sort of walled himself off and he's now only listening to one group. You know, currently, as we've said before, Labour needs to be a big tent party. It needs people from the left. It needs those centrist votes as well, because we said it every time this comes up. You look at people voting. You've got 25% who are on the right. You've got a massive, again, depending on which one you look at, 30 to 35% who come out as centrists, and then 25% on the left. So in order to win... Any general election, especially under our uh, first-past-the-post system, we have to not only get the left on board, which is why I always, always despair when the left goes, well, I'm not going to vote for Labour or I'm going to vote for the Greens. You know, because, oh, they're doing policies that will, you know, maybe attract the centrist. Well, guess what? You need the centrist in order to win. And this is where, you know, you have to compromise. You have to be pragmatic. And I've said it before that I'd rather get Labour in power and maybe get about 30% of what I want than go another, you know, four to five years of Tory rule and get absolutely nothing done or achieved of what I would love to see done in this country. So as always, uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. Please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page. And as always, uh, we'll see you all next time.